Uh, it's a very good topic, um, the question of nurturing faith in an ever-increasing faithless world. Um, I would just say that um, I think uh, a, a major obstacle for young people is the university system. Colleges and universities um, in the West, the dominant epistemology tends to be one of untruth, that there is no truth, right? Um, this goes by different types of names, critical theory. Um, probably the best term for it is postmodernism. Uh, this idea that there's no real truth, there's no objective morality, right? Uh, so when young Muslims are exposed to these ideas, it's very difficult for them to be able to articulate uh, responses um, that have some uh, substance to them. Because a lot of the rhetoric that they're hearing uh, sounds really good. Right? I would say that it's, it's um, sort of has this air of pseudo-profundity to it. It's form way over substance. When you really break down what's being said, it's full of contradictions. Even this idea that there's no truth, right? that's contradictory in and of itself. Because that's a, a statement of truth. The only absolute truth is that there is no absolute truth. Right? However, Muslims, Muslim students, or confessionals in general, it's not just Muslims, it's Christians, it's Orthodox Jews, when they enter into these institutions, um, they feel themselves sort of inadequate because their faith traditions make absolute truth claims. That there's truth, there's haq, and there's batil. Right? And this whole idea of haq and batil is something that is ridiculed in the academy. Abrahamic morality is ridiculed, is attacked in the academy. To say, for example, there are things that are moral and there are things that are not moral, right? Uh, so oftentimes, confessional students, be they, be they Muslim, Christian, or Jewish, <clears throat> the only viable solutions that they have, uh, according to them, is either to what I call sell out or check out, right? To sell out meaning, well, I need to start thinking a little bit differently about this because I don't want to offend anyone. I have to sort of mitigate the hurt feelings of people because I don't want to be offensive. Um, and sort of reinvent uh, what I think the Qur'an is saying, right? So the, uh, the literary method of postmodernism is known as deconstructionism. So this idea that there is no normative reading of anything the idea of a meta-narrative, right? The sort of overarching interpretation of a text does not exist according to deconstructionism, which is what students in high school are taught. You can make of the text whatever you want of it, right? So this idea that, um, you know, one, one of the pioneers, I was telling this to Sheikh Faraz, one of the pioneers of this movement, he said, you know, as long, there's no such thing as right and wrong. As long as it's interesting, then it's fine. All you have to be is interesting, right? So you have this, uh, this phenomenon of radical hermeneutics happening in the academy. You have people reading a text that are drawing conclusions from the text that are absolutely irreconcilable with the traditional faith uh, of the ulama or the articulations of the traditional scholars, right? But tradition seems to be part of the problem. Traditional value systems are seen as oppressive, they're seen as um, tyrannical, they're seen as patriarchal, you know? This word they really like, patriarchy. The patriarch is, you know who the patriarch is, right? So Ibrahim alayhi salam, his name means father of many nations. Abraham, ab alif ba, father of many ab father of many nations. He is the patriarch, the ruling father. So there's this idea that before the Abrahamic faith traditions, 
the world was sort of this utopia where everyone just sort of got along. It was peaches and cream. It was Disney World. And then, you know, here comes these Abrahamic faith traditions that oppress certain people, and they're still here. And this is really the, this is really the problem, uh, according to them. So this is the type of epistemology that young confessional students are up against in the academy, right? So it's incumbent upon us uh, to be extremely fortified in our faith, to at least know how to um, articulate responses in order to get people to think, you know. And it's difficult because, you know, I think it's the nature of, the nature of our dean to be, I don't know how else to put it, it's going to be offensive towards certain people. Because when you make af absolute truth claims about theology and morality, some people are going to be offended. So we have to do our best to mitigate that, but at the end of the day, there are certain parameters that we cannot um, breach because we want to be in the spirit of Allah and his messenger, right? We want, to be, we want that to be our foundation. That's our bedrock. That's, that's, um, that is really the, the basis of everything, right? Um, so we need to do a lot of spiritual work. We need to do a lot of intellectual work. From a standpoint of spirituality, it's important for us because these institutions, they breed in gratitude, right? They promote self-victimization, that you're a victim. If someone's doing better than you, if another group is better than you, it must be because they're oppressing you. You've been victimized. So this slowly but surely sort of wrings us out of shukur. And we just need to take a few minutes and just think about our lives and think about our lives uh, with respect to or compared to what's happening in the world. And that fact by itself should fill us with shukur, with gratitude. Shukur is a type of kufr, according to the Quran. Fadkuruni adhkurkum, washkuruli wala takfurun. Right? Have regard for me so that I might have regard for you. Be grateful to me. And do not disbelieve. So the, these two words really are put in juxtaposition. So in, in, um, there's a term in, that Westerners use uh, in, uh, for Arabic rhetoric. There, there's a concept called parataxis where uh, you find this in Semitic rhetoric uh, where two terms are juxtaposed because they're antonyms, they're opposites. So the opposite of shukur is kufur, right? So it's important for us to just take a moment, um, you know, every day, a few minutes, and just think about the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us, right? Just, just the, the mere fact that we're Muslims, right? After the defeat or after the uh, tragic events at Ghazwat Uhud, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in the Quran, وَلَا تَهِنُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَنْتُمُ الْأَعْلَوْنَ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ You know, don't lose heart. Don't be sad, right? Don't fret. In any case, you are in a dominant position in كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ As long as you have faith, ultimately it comes down to having faith because this, the nature of the world is that of high and low. There's ebb and flow. وَتِلْكَ الْأَيَامُ نُدَاوِلُهَا بَيْنَ النَّاسِ Right? That's the nature of the dunya. That's why we have hope. Hope is very important. We have hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have hope in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have hope in the yawm al-qiyamah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا You have in the Messenger of God a beautiful pattern of conduct. لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ وَذَّكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا For whoever has hope, raja. Hope in Allah and in the final day and makes dhikr of Allah in abundance. Right? So having hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is something that we need to cultivate. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
He is the Lord of the worlds. And He can change our situation um, uh, 180 degrees. And we recognize that. But there are certain things that we have to go through in the dunya because that is the nature of the dunya. The word dunya means a low place. That's what it literally means. So don't make this dunya into paradise. A dunya sijnul mu'min. We have to do the best we can, obviously, to create you know, a just society and whatnot. But the problem is the, the ideology that is coming out of a lot of these institutions does not recognize an afterlife. So then students, they sort of put all of their eggs in the basket of the dunya, and then the dunya disappoints them, and then they leave the religion. So they check out completely. Right? They don't want to deal with it. Right? And it's really a misunderstanding of what is the dunya, what is its nature, what are we here for? And then contemplation, um, you know, this idea of thinking about the ni'am of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This will engender shukr in our hearts. Right? So I would say, although activism is very important, I would prioritize knowledge over activism. Right? Because activism, again, very important, but uh, you're going to be disappointed because that's the nature of the world. And if you don't have the spiritual discipline to deal with these disappointments, right, and then it becomes dangerous to your iman. Right? The Prophet, وسلم, if you look at his life, you know, um, you have uh, hardship upon hardship. Right? Uh, you know, who, who, man ashaddu bala'an, who has the most severe of tribulations? He asked the Sahaba. Right? And they were probably thinking, well, you know, maybe the kuffar, you know, munafiqeen, who? He said, al anbiya, the prophets, and those closest to them. Right? If you look at the life of the Prophet, as uh, Shaykh Faraz reminded me, the Prophet وسلم, did not complain to anyone ever. He did not complain. Even on the day of, uh, the most difficult day of Ta'if, when he was stoned out of the city of Ta'if by the Bani Thaqif, the Prophet ﷺ, you know, with, with you know, blood covering his legs and people mocking him and trying to kill him. Allahumma ashku ilayka da'fa quwati. He carried his complaint to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Allah, I complain to you of the weakness of my strength. Right? So he's attributing his weakness, he's attributing his shortcomings to himself. And this is called tawadur, this is humility. This is someone who has good ubudiyah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's a difference between ibadah and ubudiyah. You can have a lot of ibadat, right? a lot of acts of worship, but ubudiyah, good ubudiyah indicates a good attitude with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? A good attitude. So breaching adab, breaching good character with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is something that's very dangerous and we seek refuge from. But a lot of times we're taught by certain institutions that this is sort of what needs to be done or that's the logical conclusion of the ideology or philosophy that young people are taught. So we need to fortify our, our spirituality. So taking time out every day and just thinking about the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this will engender shukr in the heart. Right? And the Prophet sallallahu he is the paragon of virtue. And when he would pray, there's a hadith Abu Huraira, it's mentioned in the Shema'il of Imam, Tir Imam Tirmidhi, that, that, كَانَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يُصَلِّي حَتَّى تَرِمَ قَدَمَا that the Prophet ﷺ, he would pray until his feet would swell red. And then it was said to him, why do you do this? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven your past and future transgressions. And of course the transgression of a Prophet is very different. A dhamb of a Prophet is very different than, than what we do. And his response, أَفَلَا أَكُونُ عَبْدًا shakura." Shall I not be a grateful servant? Right? And shakur, according to the ulama, is different than the shakir. 
The, the shakir is the one who is thankful. The shakur is the one who continues to thank, even in a state of deprivation. Because the shakur knows that if he's being deprived of something by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in essence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may be staving off some sort of harm from him. And so in reality, Allah is still giving to him something. But this takes spiritual discipline to come to these sort of realizations. You know. So, <clears throat> trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tawakkul is very important. Um, and, you know, it, it might, one of my teachers to told me, and maybe this is a bit cynical, but it works for me. So, <laughs> you know, and that is that, you know, don't really expect anything from anyone in the dunya, and you won't be disappointed. And obviously that's not true. You know, people that, you know, your parents, inshallah ta'ala, the mashaykh, they, they won't let you down, right? But know that this is the nature of the dunya. The nature of the dunya is to break you, right? And the shaitan is active in the dunya, and shaitan is real. And uh, oftentimes I, men I mention shaitan on the minbar, I see Muslims rolling their eyes at me. Oh, what are we, shaitan? Or, what color is this pitchfork? What is this guy talking about? No, the shaitan is real. If qala lil insan ukfur, this is what he wants to do. He says to the human being, disbelieve, right? So we have to be wary of that. I mean, people worship Satan today is very common. You have different types of Satanism. You have something called the Church of Satan. You have Crowleyan Sat Satanism or Thelema as a massive following. They have a Qibla, they call it a Qibla, uh, a house where their founder performs some sort of demonic ritual. They make pilgrimage to it, right? So Shaitan is real. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that the Prophet وسلم, is uswatun hasana. He says that one time in the Quran about the Prophet. وسلم. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the name of our deen, al Islam, eight times in the Quran. You can look this up in a concordance. How many times in the Quran does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refer to the shaitan as adu mubin? At least 15 times in the Quran. At least 15 times. And the shaitan, he wants us to disbelieve, all right? So there seems to be a relationship between an increase in ridda or apostasy seems to be commensurate uh, with a demonic presence. So in some of these institutions of higher learning, you have Muslims entering these places and I've read articles that up to half of confessionals leave the religion when they enter into these institutions of higher learning. And of course the response from academics is, well, that's because this is the first time they actually know how to think. So they're leaving their, you know, their archaic, antiquated, you know, divisive, irrelevant religious creeds and they're coming into this new enlightenment, right? But if you actually talk to some of these Muslims, and you know, I, I did 10 years in a graduate school, I'm a professor now, a lot of it has to come down, a lot of it comes down to them not knowing how to articulate things, feeling inferior, inadequate, and then choosing to leave because they just don't want to deal with it. And then if you stop praying after a while, you stop fasting, you stop making dhikr, you know, sometimes, you know, as they say, the damage has been done. It's very difficult for them to come back, you know. So it's important for us <clears throat> on the intellectual side to be able to form strong arguments, at least for traditionalism, you know. Um, because appealing to the Qur'an, they would say, well, that's just a logical fallacy. You're, uh, you're uh, appealing to unqualified authority. I don't believe in the Qur'an. And it, people will find it offensive. But that's, that's the nature of the beast, right? I mean, you can't make everyone happy and you shouldn't try. What we should concern ourselves with is making Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala happy, as it were, 
is pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the end of the day, that's the only opinion that's going to matter. In a hundred years, no one, unless you're Justin Bieber, no one on earth will be thinking of you. I try to think of a Canadian celebrity. That's the first one that popped into my head. What was another one? Ben Johnson? You guys remember him? Anyway. Um, no one is going to be thinking about you. No one's going to be looking at your picture. So we really have to think about, you know, who do we want to please, humanity or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that, that it is hoped that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put between you and those who antagonize you, mawadda, which is a type of love or mutual respect because Allah is omnipotent. That can happen, obviously. Right? And that's what we hope for. Asa Allahu. And asa in Arabic is fi'lu taraji, the, the verb of hope. It's good to have hope, as I said. So we have to keep moving. We have to keep striving. Ultimately, the dunya, the time in the dunya, is very short. It goes by quickly. I remember Y2K scare like it was yesterday. You know. Um, and as you get older, things really go faster. You know, I'm, you know, 24 now, and it's, <laughs> it's like, you know, everything just, it just moves quickly, you know. So, but that's, you know, so we put things in perspective. We try to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because ultimately that's the one, that's the one we should be concerned. He's the one that we should be concerned about. You know, and... You know, keep, uh, keep striving to, to, to speak with people with adab, but tell people the truth. Be principled, right? Um, and because the truth is powerful. The sunnah is tried and tested. It is powerful. And, uh, and people that have, you know, issues, um, there are a lot of amrad al-qulub that people have. So there's a lot of barriers to things, but as we chip away at things, and we chip away at our own hearts as well, obviously, sooner or later, inshallah ta'ala, we have hope that these things will um, be embraced and people will, will, will become Muslim and, and love Allah and His Messenger. And this could happen in a supernatural type of way. It can. The Prophet sallallahu you know, once he placed his blessed hand on the chest of Fudala, and this is a man who was going to kill him, and he just put his hand on his chest, and Fudala said that you know, before he lifted his hand from my chest, there was nobody on earth that was more beloved to me than he was. Or this happens just through virtuous conduct, right? So like, we all know the, the iconic story of the Bedouin who came and relieved himself in the masjid. This iconic story, right? The Prophet ﷺ showed him um, gentleness. فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ It is part of the mercy of Allah that you have gentleness. He was mild-mannered. And, you know, he told the, the Bedouin that this is a masjid, this is for dhikr, this is for, for qira'ah, this is for salawat. And he showed him so much gentleness and ihsan as they were leaving the masjid, the Bedouin turned around, addressing everybody, and he said, Allahumma irhamni wa muhammadan wa la tarham ma'ana ahadan. And the Prophet laughed. And he said, oh Allah, bless me, have mercy on me and on Muhammad and nobody else. Because the Sahaba wanted to, right, they were going to address the situation, to put it mildly, when he was in the masjid doing what he was doing. لَقَدْ حَجَرْتَ وَاسِعًا The Prophet وسلم, he said, you are um, constricting something that is vast, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how do we fortify ourselves spiritually? Is that we acquaint ourselves in a very intimate way with the Prophet وسلم, Right? So I mentioned this in the khutbah today. We know this. We read the seerah. And if you've already read it, read it again, read a different translation, read it in a different language with good intentions of ma'rifah of the Prophet Sallallahu that will translate to mahabba. Read the khasa'is literature about the Prophet Sallallahu What makes him so special? What makes him so unique? 
Read the Shama'il of the Prophet ﷺ. Just read about how Sahaba used to talk about him ﷺ, and how they understood his uh, reality to a degree that we can only hope and dream for. Right? And these things will fortify our faith and make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then learn argumentation but with adab. Learn the classical arguments for the existence of God. You know, do research. Uh, you know, defend our morality. I don't know what I can say in Canada. You all don't have a First Amendment. So I don't know what I can say. So I'm not going to say it but there are certain secular arguments you can make against certain lifestyles that are very, very compelling. Without even touching scripture, you can make a very compelling case that certain things are immoral and certain things are detrimental to the flourishing of society. Right? So, and the last thing I'll say is prioritize compassion over justice. People scream justice, justice. Of course, we want just societies. That's true. The Prophet ﷺ always prioritized compassion over justice. Ghazwat Uhud, again, an iconic story. The Prophet ﷺ, blood was streaming down his face, and the Sahaba saw him with his hands raised, catching his blood so it would not strike the earth. Because he said, if one drop of blood strikes the earth, then these Quraysh are finished. Right? Allahum mahdi qawmi, Allahum ighfir li qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamun. Oh God, forgive my people or guide my people for they don't know. Um, preferring justice, preferring mercy over justice. The Prophet ﷺ was long suffering. He didn't give up on people. Like Abu Sufyan ibn Harb, Amr ibn, Amr ibn al As. These are people who were trying to kill him for years and years and years. And the Prophet ﷺ didn't give up. I told this story at the khutbah today. I was in a masjid one time, youth halaka, many years ago, and a Christian brother was there, and the Christian brother was asking a lot of difficult questions. But he was being respectful. And then, and then uh, an uncle walked in. God bless the uncle. And he listened for two minutes. And he said, you know, these kuffar, why bother? You know, Allah has sealed their hearts <laughs> and blinded their eyes and deafened their ears and things like that. So, Whoa, after two minutes? That's, that's your response? You know, the Prophet Sallallahu dealt with people who are trying to kill him for over 20 years. And he didn't give up. And they became Muslim. So, you know, have, have hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Really just um, be annihilated in gratitude to Allah. Right? A lot of people now, you know, they have, they have a lot of stress. People have depression. There's mental illness. A lot of it comes down to... Um, this idea that you have, to, you have to make a change in the world, you have to be famous, you have to put your name out there. There's a lot of pressure, especially on young people. You know, it's, um, there's a, I'll end with this. There's a hadith that's attributed to Isa, alayhi salam, where he said to the Hawariyun, he said, he said, nine out of ten parts of worship is silence, is sukut. And I dedicate this to the Facebook user, users. I, I used to be a Facebook user. Not anymore, but obviously there's good and bad in things. But there are people who are addicted to social media, and it's like, you know, their attitude is tied to the end of a string that's connected to social media. So I didn't get, I didn't get you know, a lot of likes today. I'm not in a good mood. Oh, this person said that. I feel so depressed. I mean, this, to be honest, is pathetic. Look how many followers I have. Going back to Bieber, he calls them believers. Sorry, I don't know. I'm talking about Bieber up here. Um, but you know, what was I saying? <laughs> I got sidetracked by Bieber. <laughs> but Facebook, yes. So um, 
prioritize compassion. That was my point. All right. And uh, find joy in Allah and His Messenger. Um, so, Jazakallah Khairan.